Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, Anthony DeRosa joins us. He runs social media for Reuters, and he's also a really big Tumblr star. Boomerang your emails. Facebook is starting to welcome pseudonyms, but there are some catches. And Reddit is cracking down. All that and Pinwheel next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur. Episode 48, recorded Friday, February 17th, 2012. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Audible. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. Upgrade to a premium domain and trade in your old clunkers. Visit Hover.com slash social hour. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Social Hour from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, at the uh, Northern Headquarters. Sarah, thanks for having a thanks for having an offshoot of our uh, of our studios up there, Amber. It's nice to know that we have a um, Canadian representation. Uh, a lot of people in Canada, actually, a lot of people in Canada watch the Social Hour. I'm I'm seeing more and more um, Canadians writing into us and and pinging me on Twitter. So um, it's very important for us to have a presence up there. It's true, Sarah. We have the internet here. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, pretty much everything Don't that we tell have. anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Except better hockey and it's players, not too I guess. Bad. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited about our guest on on this episode of the Social Hour. Uh, without further ado, let's introduce him and bring him into the conversation. Anthony DeRosa, who is the social media editor over at Reuters. Hey, Anthony. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited. I'm glad. So I, I should I should explain why I'm so excited to have Anthony on the show. Uh, before he was ever working at Reuters, um, I got familiar with Anthony um, by a different name. Uh, I knew him as Soup, um, <laughs> a.k.a. Soup Soup, uh, who had a Tumblr blog. And when I was just getting started with Tumblr, I... For whatever reason, you know, I was just trying to find cool people to follow and, and, you know, what's going on on this network. And Anthony uh, was somebody who seemed to be pretty prolific. He was sharing a lot um, on his Tumblr, so I ended up following him. And I don't know that I've ever known anybody who at the time was not working for a news organization that was so on top of the news. This is, you know, 2007. Anthony, what the heck? How did you, how did you choose Tumblr? I mean, wh- how, how did that all start? Well, uh, I was a very early adopter of the service back in 2007. I think it was mostly San Francisco and New York users that were heavy on Tumblr at the time. It hadn't really gone international yet. Uh, Different parts of the country really haven't started to pick it up. And it was really a simple way for me to upload photos from my camera phone. At first, that's how I used it. And if uh, if you would have gone back to my early archives, there are a lot of pictures of me at a alligator preserve in Florida. And I was shooting photos that all these alligators that I was seeing visiting my uh, folks down there. Uh, but th- quickly, I, I began to realize that there are other people on the service. And the real the real magic of it is being able to see what other people are posting and finding interesting things, grabbing them and adding your own commentary to it. And there's people that are posting things about um, fashion and design and technology. But I was really kind of keyed in on uh, news stuff. And when big news would break or if there were things going on like with the Irish Spring, I started to pick up a lot of that stuff and uh, and use it as a, a news reporting source. And people started to come to me a lot to see what was going on with the Arab Spring for a while. Were you looking for a job you know, in a newsroom? Is this just something that you enjoyed doing and you had enough free time to be able to be completely on top of it, to be the one that I mean, for many people was breaking news on Tumblr? Um, well, I would... Uh, at my job at the time, I was on in product uh, and I was working on financial stuff. So whenever I had lags in the day where, you know, I just wanted to see what was going on in the world, I would jump on different news sites. And then after discovering Tumblr, people were aggregating and, and grabbing the really big stories. And I would use Tumblr as a way because I didn't have a lot, a lot of time in the day to, to go read really long form articles. But they would give you short glimpses and I was able to fit that into little brief periods of the day and grab 
web things and people think, oh, how do you work and, and uh, see all this information? But t Tumblr makes it so quick and easy for you to either uh, take in that information or share that information. I was able to kind of fit that into my day, whether I was at work or I was at, whether I was at home. I, I'm really curious, and I'm sure a lot of people who watch this show would be interested in this as well, as far as how you manage your own personal brand and your professional brand inside of Reuters. Sarah and I have talked about this in the past. Just, uh, I'm sure it's an ad advantage to Reuters that you, you do have the social media presence kind of outside of there. But are there ever conflicts? How do you, how do you keep up with everything within the context of also having a professional title? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really separate them and uh Reuters is really actually pretty cool about that they feel like there's value in not just me but all their journalists um being real personable sharing things uh that they find interesting and you know they're all tend to be news geeks so you know sometimes there'll be something silly like uh that that meme about uh, uh val on valentine's day uh, who you happen to love on Twitter. I have no idea how they came up with that, but apparently uh, I love Reuters. <laughs> and Reuters <laughs> loves Paul Smeller, who's our opinion editor. And uh, and then it goes to, ties back to Reuters again. But uh, yeah, sometimes it's silly stuff like that, or you know, t sometimes it's real serious stuff about what's what's happening in economics. There's Felix, uh, our, uh, our finance blogger, explaining the Greek debt crisis using rubber ducks. Uh, so yeah, it kind of goes across the board and, and our reporters, uh, like myself, they'll, they'll share things, uh, that may not always be specific to news, but just interesting things that they're seeing. We should talk about Reuters because I'm really curious as to how you ended up getting a job there with the title social media editor, because Amber and I talk about this all the time. There are all these social media job descriptions, but they can be kind of muddy. It's sort of hard to know what people are actually doing day to day. How did this job at Reuters come about? Did they, was there a job posting? Did you create one for yourself? Yeah, there was a job posting, you know, that they had looked for someone who would be able to focus in on the social media aspect of how they cover the news. And I felt like I would be an ideal person to do something like that. And they, they didn't, they kind of realized quickly that they had someone under their noses who was really focused in on that stuff. So uh, they came to me and said, why don't you apply for this job? I think, you you know, you'd be ideal for it. Um, and actually around the same time, uh, David Carr works at the New York Times uh, as a friend of mine, and and, uh, and he read something on my Tumblr about how I felt like I was a digital surf uh, in this huge feudal empire of social networks, which is kind of <laughs> ironic uh, because the point I was making was, oh, I'm giving away all this content and I'm not getting anything out of it. Well, the thing I got out of it was that I was able to uh, get an opportunity to do what I was doing uh, you know, as a freelancer and make it a career. I think within some of these organizations, they don't necessarily take social media that seriously. And in, in some ways, it becomes almost an afterthought. Um, what has your experience been like at Reuters? No, I mean, it's really deeply embedded in uh, to how we're reporting. And, and if you could look at the way that we do a lot of our live blogs, we're pulling in a lot of content that we're seeing uh, surface up on things like YouTube and uh, Flickr. And they are often... Uh, brought to people's attention through social networks like Twitter uh, and Twitter uh, being a place where if people are reporting things uh, either uh, as a citizen journalist or as a traditional journalist linking to a video or a photo and then we pull that into things like our live blog. So when we're watching what's happening, um, you know, in Egypt or Tunisia or uh, even something like the, the Greek debt crisis, if there's little glimpses of information that we see on social media, we're pulling that into our, our traditional platforms like Reuters.com. So social media is kind of blurring into all the other things that we've done previously. You also work on something called Tectonic, which is uh, tech-focused videos for Reuters TV, something that Amber and I can, uh, it's right up our alley, let's just say the content anyway. <laughs> how often do you, uh, how often do you uh, host those videos? Um, is it something that, that, that you had to convince Reuters to let you do, or um, are they beefing up their, their TV enterprise as well? Yeah, this is like a, a big new push uh, for us to get into doing a lot more video, um, and I was asked early on to to you know potentially be a show uh and i i did one about how i was using social media to surface up uh stories um and uh, in particular it was at the time when uh there was a man in india who was uh fasting 
uh, uh, to try to get the government to change the way they were doing things. And that video led on to other videos. So it just kind of snowballed. I did one and then I started to do another and another and another. And now I'm doing like three or four of these a week, um, you know, either based on interesting interviews I can do, like Don Tapscott, who you're, in, you're seeing now, or like today where Google's uh, been caught possibly uh, gathering information about users. So well, they'll, they'll just come to me on that day when the news breaks and they'll be like, we should do a video about this. Let's... Uh, Let's have you talk about what you know and what you're hearing and, and people that you're interviewing about this particular topic. I'm just curious, uh, because like Sarah mentioned, we both have worked in the video business and in television as well. How quickly can you turn around those pieces? What's your sort of setup and uh, how big is the team that goes out to shoot it? Is it you or uh, a couple of people? We're we're pretty quick. Uh, we have a growing team. I don't know exactly how many folks we have now, but it's definitely grown quite a bit in the past couple of months. Um, and sometimes we could turn a video around in the same day. Uh, if uh, We have really great producers and editors. Some people uh, wear multiple hats. Some of them are, are, are able to shoot, uh, produce, and edit uh, and, and some of them I think could but even potentially host. I mean, we have some really talented people on our video team. So I, I think you're going to see a lot more stuff from them and, and us turning around videos quicker, but also probably doing a lot more long, longer pieces, uh, new, more investigative reports where we take our time and uh, go a little bit deeper as well. I noticed uh, when we were showing uh, your website, when we were scrolling uh, past some of your recent entries, there was an entry that you have over 200,000 uh, 200,000, yes, followers on Tumblr. Now, I am not so into Tumblr these days. I have to kind of remind myself to go there regularly. But even when I was very active on Tumblr, I know that that is a very large number. It's hard to get there. In fact, I know somebody who's almost at 100,000, and he'd be crushed to know that you're uh, more than twice uh, the amount of followers that he has. That's a really, that's a really big following. I mean, your posts get, I mean, it's easy to get over 100 likes on pretty much anything you post. I know that Details just uh, added you as a, a social maverick in their sort of top 10 roundup of, of social people to watch. Anthony Bourdain follows your Twitter and has said so publicly. I mean, how, do you, how do you keep the momentum going? What if you wanted to stop one day? Do you ever, do you ever worry about that? No, I mean, I would. I never really um, made it a point to do any of this. I just did it because I enjoyed it. So uh, I'll always continue to do it. I don't. It doesn't meet, really matter if there's attention towards it. Uh, the fact that there's two hundred thousand people on Tumblr following me kind of blows my mind. I don't even know how that even happened. <laughs> um, but it starts out really small. That number, uh, I had very few followers for a long time in the beginning, but. Um, you know, once you start to, to get certain posts that go viral, you know, more and more people start to follow you. And once the number gets high, you start to pick up more followers more quickly because there's more people to share your stuff. Uh, I just have a question here from someone on Google+. Plus. Uh, so this is fitting for the show. It's from Chris Carlock. And he asks, what are your thoughts on online market segmentation between businesses marketing their products or services and the customers trying to find solutions online? Uh, so basically, he says he's talking about social media marketing noise. Um, so I have to be honest, I don't really get into the whole marketing aspect of, of social media. I'm, I kind of stick to the editorial side of things and uh, the news side of things. And I know there's always folks that are always asking for, you know, what are the tips to, to gain a million followers or how do businesses leverage social media? I don't feel like I'm a good expert when it comes to that stuff. I just kind of use it to, to, to tell people what I think is important in news or, or what my gut judgment is about news and uh, and just interesting or, or uh, stuff that, that, that seems to excite me or interest me. So I don't know how to answer that type of question. <laughs> well, it sounds like, I mean, your, your, your strategy is to just be in there, um, to be yeah. reading all the time and sharing all the time. And so that is kind of, I guess, the way that you've amassed a big following yourself is just keeping at it. Yeah, I'd be authentic and just talk about things that you uh, sincerely are interested in. If you're trying too hard to fit into a market segmentation or attract a specific audience, it's never going to really work. So it really kind of has to be natural. And I think since I always focused on things that I was interested in, I never really felt like uh, it was difficult to do. What excites you the most about the role that you're in right now and the future of social media as far as being a journalist in this time right now? 
Uh, because it's such a transformative time for media and that uh, people are trying to figure out business models and how social media uh, ties into editorial and news. And I'm getting to have a hand in uh, helping to integrate social media into how we uh, inform people about things that are happening in the world. So that's one of the things that's really exciting, um, you know, producing new news products, working with uh, someone like Alex Leo and our product team to build things like Social Pulse that we launched uh, a couple of weeks back and really evolving that and using it not just as a way to show metrics about uh, things that are happening in social media and surfacing stories that people are uh, sharing quite a bit, but also using it as more of an entry point for the live blogs that we do because I feel like um, you know, th for, for news and editorial live blogs are really – the place where traditional media and uh, social media start to mesh. I have just one more question for you. This is, well, I don't know if this is an easy question to answer or not, but I had uh, I had uh, put a public post out on Google Plus earlier today saying that you were going to be on our show and, and uh, bombard us with questions. I have had an issue with Google Plus as of late because I feel like <laughs> there are a lot of spam accounts or uh, there are people that, um, responding to me in a language that I can't read. I'm just not sure what's going on there. What are your thoughts on the various ways that you can share with people on all social networks? I know you're familiar with them. What are your favorites? Which ones do you think um, aren't here for the for the long haul? I think it's still early for Google+. Plus. I don't want to say that it's not going to work. I know they had a lot of folks join early on. Um, and it seems like it's not a broad audience yet. It's more kind of a techie media focused audience. And I'm not really seeing a, a real nice balance of, of types of folks who are interacting on uh, Google Plus. So I, I'll give it more time, you know, give it give it a year, see where it's at at that point. But I really get the most out of something like Twitter because I'm such a news junkie and it, it kind of allows me to focus in on the stuff that I'm really interested in. And there, I get a lot of good dialogue. I can uh, interact with people that I feel like are going to provide really good information. Tw Tumblr is more of a artistic and creative outlet. I see people there that are posting beautiful photographs and great videos. It's a much more of a visual medium. And uh, and if I'm looking to kind of get into more, more of my creative artistic side, I'll, I'll spend more time on Tumblr. Um, and Facebook, you know, Facebook has this gigantic audience. It's more about a place where friends and family I can reconnect with. So they all have a kind of a little bit of a different purpose. And um, from a news standpoint, I'm still trying to figure out what the best way to use Facebook is. And I don't think I'm completely there yet. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really interesting talking to you. And I think for a lot of people, you probably have uh, what could be their dream job. Uh, sounds like a pretty interesting gig. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Anthony, for joining us. Now, get back to work on that Google privacy story <laughs> you've been tweeting All right. about. <laughs> and Sarah, it's been great. I, I've been a huge fan of yours ever since the, the G4 days. So All right. it's, uh, it's a pleasure to finally uh, see <laughs> you in person. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Virtually. man. I appreciate that as well. The, the feeling is mutual. I've been an admirer of yours since... Oh, 2007 or so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> see, see you ago. online. That's Anthony DeRosa, social media editor at Reuters. And, of course, uh, Tumblr star, soupsoup.tumblr.com. you got to follow this guy. He will, uh, he will keep you up to date on pretty much everything you need to know about. Thanks again, Anthony. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you. Take care. Happy Friday. Quick reminder that we usually record the social hour live on Mondays at 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we are recording on Friday. If you're watching us live, you already know this. Uh, a little bit early because Monday is President's Day in the U.S. and the Twit Brick House will be closed. The lights will be turned off and Amber and I will not be able to do a show. But normally, Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, if you miss a show or if you want to look back on any of the links that we talked about, you say to yourself, Anthony, see Seems like a cool dude. I don't remember what his Tumblr site is. Don't worry about it. We have all those links at twit.tv slash TSH. Those are where our show archives live, where our video archives live, and where all of our subscription links live. Subscription links are really helpful because once you subscribe to the show, you don't really have to think about when we are putting out a new episode because it will be hand-delivered to you, of course, for free. Subscription can always be a sort of a weird term to people, but you guys know we don't charge for any of our stuff on Twit. That's Amber and me last week, in fact. Yeah, it's the stripes. <laughs> so, uh, again, twit.tv slash TSH bookmark it. Uh, it's there for you. Lots of good information there. You can always email us as well at the social hour at twit.tv. 
All right, Amber, before we get into some of the news of the week, let's take a quick break and thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. If, you ha- if you're not familiar with Audible, it has over 100,000 titles for audiobooks and even some periodicals that are read to you. 100,000, even more than that. I mean, that's such a huge library. It's almost difficult to know where to point you specifically when I tell you that if you use audiblepodcast.com slash the social hour as a special URL, you can get a free book for signing up with Audible. That's right. I don't know which book you should choose. There's so many. What's nice, though, is that Audible breaks them down into nice categories. We've got we've got radio shows. We've got uh, new releases. We have bestsellers. I mean, this is the sort of stuff where you, you've seen something at the New York Times uh, bestseller list, and finally you're you're ready to dive in, but maybe you just, you're just you not going to have time to sit down and read that book. You know you won't. You're a commuter. You spend a lot of time at the gym. Maybe you like to go on nice long walks. You need something to listen to. Um, and there's a really co- there's a really cool element of, of an audio book. Um, it uh, helps flex the imagination in ways that reading doesn't. So uh, definitely go on over to Audible and check out their selection. And if you use, again, audiblepodcast.com slash social hour, when you sign up for an account, you get a free book. Free book. Gotta love it. The Hunger Games, for example. It's going to be a really big movie. Don't you want to read the book first? Bet you do. And then uh, if, you, uh, if you're looking around the site, too, and you're just trying to get a sense of what's this book going to sound like, they have nice little audio excerpts. So you get a sense of... Uh, what the uh, what the what, what the cadence of you know the flow of the whole thing you just you get a good side. sense of the what the Hunger Games body, sounds their like. Their cheeks pressed together. Aha, uh-huh, Carolyn sleep, McCormick. My mother looks younger. See, she's got a great voice. Worn, I love it already. So beaten down. Sometimes the authors will read their own books, too, and that's really helpful, depending on the author, of course. But again, the URL you need to remember: audiblepodcast.com slash social hour free book. And thanks to Audible for sponsoring our little show. All right, Amber, moving on to some news of the week. Facebook introduced verified accounts and pseudonyms um, started rolling live to everybody, I believe it was yesterday, um, which is a little bit like what Google Plus ended up uh, turning on recently, where you, you now can be, I could be Sarah Lane, or if I was known as some sort of a stage name or there was just an alternate name that I went by online, I could now potentially have that on Facebook. What's weird, though, about it, Amber, is that (laughs) Facebook doesn't allow you to campaign for this. You can't... I know. There's no special email address to say, listen, I'd, I'd really like to do this. They have to seek you out. I find this a little bit confusing too, Sarah. I mean, we've seen verified accounts before with Twitter, uh, with uh, Google Plus, and uh, it seems as though the way that Facebook is doing it is a little bizarre. I actually got uh, an invite to verify my own account, and I started to go through the process. And for me, I'm not really sure what the incentive would be. Clearly, if there's people out there who use uh, pseudonyms, uh, like you mentioned, um, and uh, don't necessarily want to just use their real name, um, they would want to uh, take advantage of something like this. But because Facebook is actually handpicking people who they're sending invites to, I think it makes it a little bit unfair for uh, the masses who, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of people with lots of, who have lots of reason to want to use a pseudonym uh, or a nickname on Facebook. Totally agree with you. I got the same prompt uh, this morning. I was, I was actually kind of excited because I don't have that many subscribers. And by the way, this is the sort of thing where to be verified, you don't need to, you know, I, I don't need to be like, I'm Cher. I, you know, it's a, it's a separate name besides my birth name. I could just choose to be verified if Facebook reached out to me, which they did. I, I uh, took a picture of my driver's license because you have to have some sort of a government issued ID. Um, uh, you know, if you don't have that, you have to have a couple other forms of identification, library card, that sort of thing. And then upload that photo to them. It's interesting. What's kind of, um, what's kind of interesting, I, had, uh, I was about to upload my driver's license. Like, yeah, sure, Facebook, here you go. They even say, hey, please have any sensitive information blacked out or covered up, like your driver's license number. Now, that was the sort of thing where I, I went into Skitch, which is an easy photo editing program, and went ahead and scratched out my driver's license number, and then went ahead and scratched out my address and um, my signature type of thing, because I thought, yeah, it's a pretty good idea. But Facebook is also uh, saying explicitly, once you've uploaded your information and we verify that that is indeed you so that you can go ahead and have a verified account, we'll get rid of this information. Okay, assuming that they mean what they say, 
it's a little weird that they want to make sure that my driver's license isn't going to get out there somehow if Facebook is being really careful with these files. I don't know. I, you know, my, my initial reaction when I got the invite was sort of similar to you, Sarah, where I was excited. Okay. This is an opportunity to verify my account. And then, um, you know, they may put you on a list of people who you can, you should subscribe to. But as soon as I saw that note to actually share government issued ID, it just kind of sent the wrong message to me. And I immediately closed the little window. Um, I, I think it's smart to do what you did in terms of blocking out that information, but, uh, it just didn't sit, it didn't sit well with me. I don't know how other people feel about it, but, um, I get that they want to do something like that, but I'm not sure uh, if people should even ever be in the habit of uploading government ID to the internet. <laughs> I don't either. And, and really, I don't think that you and I are, you know, although I guess you can feel flattered that Facebook's like, you need to be verified because you're special. It's not really for people like you and me. I think it's for people who are spoofed a lot online. Yeah. And Facebook wants them to have an incentive to feel like Facebook's a fun place to hang out and they're not going to be all these fake Kim Kardashian pages so that the real Kim Kardashian is like, ah, oh, screw Facebook. It's hard to hang out there because mm. uh, nobody really knows who the real one is. That sort of thing makes more sense. For you and me and a lot of people who spend a lot of time online, it's it's pretty easy to know who's who. And yeah. uh, what, what does it matter what Facebook thinks? And I think, you know, there's a whole group of people outside of just people who are celebrities who may want to hide their identity or change their identity or use a pseudonym. Um, we've talked about this before on the show, people who are victims of abuse, for example, uh, teachers who don't want to go on to Facebook with their full names. I mean, there are plenty of examples of people who, who perhaps don't want to share their real identities. And you're right. It's like, it's not getting to the people who need it as far as the invitations, the way they were sent out. It would make, make much more sense if you could request that and uh, then then you could go through the process that way versus the way that they've handled it. So I did find it a little bit, a little bit confusing. You know, it's like fifty. It's fifty percent of it. I think is a you know, it's a good thing. Um, but just like anything, Facebook does. Sometimes I just think. Uh, when they're rolling out new features and functionality and privacy, they just do some things. And I think that's Mark Zuckerberg and the team. They've always talked about this being kind of the, I guess they call it like the hacker way. You know, you push it out there and see what happens. Um, but I think when it comes to sharing government issued ID, I don't know if that they should be experimenting to see how this goes. PDG1 in chat says, why can't they use this for removing fake accounts rather than using it to verify real accounts? Now, one would think that the two go hand in hand. Once you've got a real account, there might be a huge database of accounts that can be wiped out and this just gives it a little bit more legal standing but yeah i mean i think that that's really what twitter facebook google plus certainly that's the real problem it's not so much is amber MacArthur verified you know in our terms of service it's more we want to weed out all this garbage because yeah. it's it's um it's, it's, I don't know, it brings any social network down. Um, and I think that Google Plus is where I notice it the most, but certainly Facebook and Twitter um, mm -hmm. have their issues. Speaking of issues, Reddit, uh, a, a champion of free speech online, social network, uh, you know Reddit, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a voting system of stories, um, mm. also has a very big subreddit community. In fact, Tech News Today, we have a subreddit, uh, technewstoday.reddit.com, where we invite people who watch our show to submit news stories that they want us to talk about, voting them up and down, and very, very helpful for us. Um, and anybody can create a subreddit about a particular topic or just a little bit more focused than all the news in the whole world that would be more on the uh, front page of Reddit. However, Reddit has uh, recently decided to go ahead with new rules began banning suggestive subreddits specifically regarding child pornography. Now, of course, no one watching the show is going to say, what? They should have child pornography. That's great. Uh, obviously, we're all against child pornography. But it's, you know, it, it can be seen as a slippery slope. Once Reddit starts to, uh, you know, ban what some people might call free speech about a certain topic, what's next, that sort of thing. Um, Reddit had a, had a statement that said, listen, uh, we, we absolutely have not changed our, our feelings about, about what Reddit represents, what people who use Reddit should be able to say. However, this particular topic... I think they use I bless you. I think they they use the word toxic. Uh, this is not this is not good for any online community, especially ours. And you know we'll continue to um, work on these sorts of cases 
on a case by case basis. And yeah, I think that even something like Reddit or 4chan, I mean, you can think of 4chan as even, you know, it's kind of Reddit gone wild. These are the, these are the sorts of things that these sites have to worry about. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I think it's one of those things where if they don't, I, I don't have a huge issue with this. I think, you know, at at some point we have to start uh, protecting children online and doing more about child pornography. And if that means that, um, you know, you have to have social networks like this go in and kind of clamp down on different groups that are set up. Um, although I think, you know, some people may worry about freedom of speech. Um, I, I just think it's the worst thing we could do is just kind of let people post and do whatever they want, because clearly that doesn't work in all cases um, and it isn't working in the case of um, minors being victims and um, and uh, and and uh, child pornography spreading across the internet, so I think it's I think it's a good thing that they've done this personally. Um, and uh, um, hopefully, this may encourage other services to follow suit. And uh, this is uh, you know it's not a topic that's going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, unfortunately, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so good on good on you, Reddit. I think they I think they they went about it the right way. Listen, this is what we decided to do. If you don't like it, you can leave. But if you don't like it, then we probably have a problem with you anyway. All right, let's move on to our social tip of the week. Okay, so this is a fun one, Sarah. It's a service called Boomerang. And uh, the idea behind it, it's a, a plugin for Gmail. And if you, and this happens to me all the time, sometimes I'll resend myself emails because I want them to float to the top of my inbox because uh, I always have trouble managing all of the emails coming in. Boomerang will allow you to do this. So all you do is when you boomerang an email, you're telling Boomerang when you want that email to be sent back to you. So I could decide that, hey, you know what? I can't deal with this email from Sarah right now about the outline. I don't need to do this till tomorrow. So I will get that sent back to me at 9 a.m. tomorrow. So it ends up being at the top of my inbox. So really simple tool for Gmail users um, to use their email inbox more effectively and get rid of some of those emails that they don't need to really deal with at that very moment. This is great. So this is a Chrome plugin, um, although it looks like they have versions for Firefox Firefox, and Safari. So that's good. Um, I'm looking at the Chrome plugin anyway. Maybe it's because they they knew that I was on Chrome. So I got directed to this page. I love this idea, Amber, because I have the same problem that you do. In fact, yeah. it's some it's somewhat embarrassing sometimes the way that I use email to remind myself of things because I know that if all else fails, if I check nothing else on a given day, I will check my email account. Yeah. That's just it's kind of like the last ditch. I will I will check this if I need you know I'll even remind myself in subject lines about doctor's appointments, all sorts of stuff. And again, yeah, it's like the first five emails I'm going to see after that, uh, we're all busy and things tend to get buried. So I do really like this idea. And I guess you could either people, especially who use Gmail, um, and take advantage of labels and starring things and pr- pr- a variety of folders that say, well, you guys just need to be more organized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess so. But I think anything to get through our email, I think this is the one thing that no one's been able to figure out is just the pain of the email process. You know, as much as you want to delete emails, they keep coming back in and there's no great way to manage it. So you almost need a lot of these tools and plugins to be able to um, sort through it and have your own little tips and tricks and uh, try to uh, try to manage it at, at some level that doesn't feel too stressful. So uh, this is definitely a fun one. And like I said, just I mean, really seamless integration. It just puts a little uh, a little icon at the top of your inbox at the right hand side. And then you can uh, select an email um, and then boomerang it and uh, set up the exact time and day. So um, I think it's kind of cool. If there's cool really, yeah, simple. there's there's no right way to handle email, right? There's there's the inbox <laughs> zero people and I applaud them big golf clap here. It's never really worked for me. It's just not something that works for my flow. Um, Hmm. But then again, I also have the issue of emails getting buried and then saying, okay, what was Amber, what were we talking about? I could do a search for Amber's name, but that's going to be like a million emails. And so then you get into that whole, there was an email, but I don't know how far back it was. Boomerang would be great for that. Yeah, and I think it's like I go through days where I feel like, oh, I'm really on top of my email, but then 80% of the time I'm not. You know, I just feel like I'm always, always behind. Um, so uh, just a, a really fun and uh, and simple tool. So that is boomerangmail.com. Love that social tip. You know, another, um, another little place that I think uh, might be good for our audience to have on their radar is a new site called Beta Kit. Um, and this is actually made by Sarah Prevett, 
who mm. was a guest of ours back at, oh gosh, last year sometime, um, who was responsible for one of my very favorite newsletters, Browder Weekly, uh, which uh, is a great newsletter that I subscribe to that just gives me a sense of new services, startups, community uh, events that are going on. So Beta Kit is, is neat because it's a lot of the same types of topics that Sprouter um, keeps me, gives me alerts on, but in a journalistic format. Um, they also, if you go to their About page, they have a nice little blurb where they say, listen, uh, tech journalism is good for a lot of things. It's down at the bottom page, <laughs> bottom of the page, Chad. Chad's looking for that About. Um, but they say, you know, without calling anybody out specifically, there's there's a lot of ego kind of nonsense going on in tech journalism and one-upping and editorial bias. And they're, they're really trying to, um, right off the bat, uh, leave that all behind. Now, that's difficult to do. I think all sites probably feel that way um, at some point. And sometimes things just happen. It's a competitive world in the world of tech journalism but i do like i like the site i like the content yeah, i think they've got a great message um I'm, I'm i'm excited to uh to add it to my uh to my reading list yeah it just it, it is neat to see the really intense focus on startups and and we all know they're just am, am, amazing companies all around the world who are doing uh so many innovative things so uh, i can't think of it you know i i feel like TechCrunch. They started out like this to focus more on startups and, and new companies launching. But um, like they say in the mandate for a, a beta kit, um, now TechCrunch deals with a lot of the bigger, more established companies as well. That too. And and there's a lot of there there's a lot of personal attacking going on. Mm-hmm. I'm not calling out TechCrunch either. I, th- I see it all the time. Um, and with, especially for tech news today. I mean, I read more tech news on a daily basis than I've ever read before Ever. And yeah. it's it's fun. I mean, it's great to feel like I'm really dialed in, but you also have to weed through a lot of what seems like a waste of time. You know, mm-hmm. agendas, personal agendas, that sort of thing. Uh, it's it's we, we need more um, beta kits. Definitely. <laughs> going forward. So good luck to them. All right. So uh, now it is time for our viewer feedback and our listener feedback. And we have uh, uh, a couple of different emails. The first one is from Melissa, who goes by at MMBC on Twitter. She says, just listening to the discussion on specialist versus strategist in the last two companies I've been with, one an agency and another as part of the internal marketing team, we have had the specialist role in all departments, not just marketing. Both companies have used it to describe a junior person in a specific area, like a communication specialist, a web specialist, a social media specialist. It's the lowest position um, other than the general admin non-specific skill set where a strategist is a more senior position uh, proposing ideas instead of just executing. don't know if this is helpful, but in my sample of uh, two companies, they use both specialist in this way. Uh, and then she says she's not a fan of the title personally. So uh, it's, you know, it's funny because <laughs> you can really dive deep into this topic, Sarah. We have touched on it um, over the past week and it's amazing to see how many titles there are in the social media world world, marketing world, and uh, just the differences like we saw last week in terms of the pay and the responsibilities, and um, there's no real clear lines. I think in a way, at, at first, I, in our last episode, we talked about this, and, and my thought was, hey, you're calling somebody a specialist. I mean, why would they be so low on the totem pole, which is kind of what Melissa is reinforcing here is, yeah, the specialists are here. They're, you know, one step above an assistant. And then the strategists are more strategizing rather than just executing. I think, and anybody who works in the business, let me know if I'm right or not, that it's a little bit more about public perception. Everyone in the company knows that the specialist isn't top dog. But if I, as a consumer, am having an issue with a company and I'm interfacing with somebody who is a social media specialist, that might make me think, ooh, well, they definitely know what they're talking about. Uh, this is a, a person that's got some skill here and um, I'm going to take them more seriously. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So uh, thank you for that feedback. And we've been getting a few emails and tweets and um, about that topic of conversation over the past week. Yes. Lots of, lots of stuff. Uh, all right, Sarah, our tweet of the week. This is I'm a fun excited. one. 
I know. This is really interesting. There's a bit of a backstory here. So our tweet of the week is actually more like a hashtag of the week. And a hashtag is tell Vic everything. Um, this is a hashtag that uh, originated in Canada. However, it was trending worldwide uh, just a couple of days ago. It was one of the top two topics worldwide. And here's a little bit of the backstory. So a Canadian member of parliament uh, was pushing forward a bill, a domestic spying bill that requires ISPs to log your online activity and give it to police without a warrant. Um, he said that if you don't do this, that you stand with child pornographers if you don't back this bill and you don't agree with this bill. Well, I'm sure that, that you, as you can imagine, there are a lot of people who are advocates for privacy um, who were not happy about this statement. And what they did is that they started to flood his account, the MP's account, the member of parliament with the hashtag tell Vic everything. Uh, and the list of things that people have said goes on and on and on. Just random things like, hey, Vic, I'm about to get up this morning and have bread breakfast. Just thought you should know. Hashtag tell Vic everything. Oh, um, this is great. And it's a great example of, I think, a Twitter protest uh, as far as getting involved in the political process. Absolutely. Well, that's, I mean, he, he invited this, didn't he? This is great. I'm going to, w- I would like to tell Vic everything. I mean, since he's listening, I've got all sorts of stuff to say. Nobody else wants to hear it. Yeah, there's so many different things. One guy wrote, um, um, I, I want to go to for a walk, but my dog doesn't like umbrellas and it's raining. Uh, <laughs> hashtag tell Vic everything. And, and I mean, it just it goes on and on and on. There's literally thousands and thousands of messages and it's still happening right now. Um, so a very interesting story. There's even a Twitter account that's been set up. Uh, I believe it's called Vicky Leaks uh, 30. And the idea there is someone is actually sharing information about uh, this member of parliament about his uh, his divorce many years ago. They're actually sharing you know information that is uh, accessible uh, to the public, and uh, it's just it, it, a bit of a, a Twitter protest from Canadians and beyond our borders as well. You know, Amber and I uh, we we sometimes put our rundown together. We, we 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 both put the rundown together of all the stuff that we're going to talk about in the show, and just by pure coincidence, we have two stories that reference child pornography. I know that won't happen next week. Let's hope. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it's there there is a there is a some sort of a balance, of course, between again mm-hmm. privacy advocates, uh, free speech advocates. Um, and, and and the other side of, of the spectrum. I'm sure that Vic, uh, hopefully he sees a, some humor in this um, and perhaps sees where where words can be misconstrued, you know, if uh, if you're if you're insinuating that people uh, are are bad uh, because they're they're not agreeing with some sort of a yeah. part of the political process, but it's pretty lighthearted. Um, I'm good. I'm going to tell Vic everything. Uh, when we the <laughs> do show. it, Sarah. Do I it, Sarah. <laughs> um, all right. So if anyone has any feedback you want to let us know, I know we're searching through all of our different social networking accounts while we're doing the show, uh, but also you can write us at the social hour at twit.tv. Uh, you can leave us a voicemail. I don't know about you, Sarah, but I love getting voicemails uh, for the show in particular at 2626 social uh, or record a video um, and upload it and send it to us, but keep it short, you know, 30 seconds or less. Um, super easy just to record a really fast video and uh, don't do it while you're driving. Yes. If you're not driving, we want to see your lovely faces. Um, yeah, anything you want. Get creative. It'll be fun. And Okay, let's, uh, before Amber uh, um, presents us with her rad or fad of the week, we want to thank Hover for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. Hover has two domain services to talk about, premium domains and something they like to call clunker trade-ins. Premium domains are kind of how they sound. Sometimes there are domains that would be perfect for your new business. Having the right domain is so important when you're trying to, to launch something, you want to have a good name, something that people will remember that's easy to type, that sort of thing. All right, well, Hover has a special area where you'll see these domains that have little stars next to them, and these are domains domains that are a little bit more expensive because they're catchy, uh, the, you know, the, they're common words, that sort of thing. So Hover uh, tries to make it as easy as possible for you to find those domains. They have, they have regular domains too. This is not just a premium service. This is just something that Hover has started offering that makes it really easy for people to search for stuff, to know what our domain is going for. Weed names, for example, is only $800. You should get it now. And, uh, and so that's, that's their premium domain domain service. What Hover also has 
that might even be more helpful to you is something called clunker domain trade in so if you have domains that you've registered or renewed at hover and there's a good chance that you have uh, domain hoarders i used to be one <laughs> uh, you might like to upgrade domain and hover will take those domains back so they'll credit everything that you spent on your old clunker domain with hover and the original registration fee any renewal fees that sort of thing and then you can put that money towards the domain that you really want because you're into a new project now or you want to i don't know reinvent yourself anything like that so if you want to visit hover today it's hover.com slash social hour that's just kind of the special url to let them know that we sent you which helps us and helps you and we keep doing the show. If you want a standard non-premium domain, we have an offer code for you. It's easy to remember, social hour. So hover.com slash social hour. If you want 10% off of your standard, so that's not one of the premium domains, just a regular domain, uh, use the offer code social hour and you get an additional 10% off. Um, you can get uh, information on trading in your clunker domains as well. Once you are on their website, they've got a great website. It's, it's so easy. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to use, looks nice. It's just not a lot of questions at all. So again, hover.com slash social hour. And we thank them so much for sponsoring our show. All right, Sarah, rad or fad time. Okay, so uh, this one is not yet available to the public. However, I think we should talk about it because it is making headlines all over the place. Uh, it is a new service from Katerina Fake. We all know her as uh, one of the co-founders of Flickr and, of course, of Hunch, uh, both which have been acquired for uh, many millions of dollars. So she has a great track record. Uh, she has a new service called Pinwheel. And the idea of Pinwheel is that you find and leave notes around the world at certain locations. Uh, now, I have been trying to figure out a little bit more about this service in terms of reading a bunch of different articles. Um, I'm not sure I've quite grasped it. I like the idea, but um, do you have any insight into this, Sarah? What do you think of it? Well, I heard about Pinwheel probably like you did yesterday. Uh, yeah. it, 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 it went around my social media circles of people saying, Pinwheel looks great. And of course, Katerina Fake having Flickr and Hunch under her belt mm. is somebody very respected um, as far as new services go. But they're in closed beta, so I put in my email address. I haven't heard anything yet. I hope, to, I hope to be invited soon. But yeah, I'm wondering. I can't imagine that it's like sticky notes around the world. I know. So yeah, where do the note? How are the notes left? What it does sound like is if if there were, if, if it was some sort of a virtual note type thing that seems to be really really popular these days. I, I I've I think we're we we have more and more. Um, not just travel services, but services that help people help other people have the best time possible when they end up going to a location that somebody has visited before or has a good tip about. There seems mm. to just be a lot of interest in that sort of thing. Um, and I, if Pinwheel is along those lines, I'm already interested because I love crowdsourced knowledge um, about locations because... I like going to new places, and I like having a little bit of backstory when I go there. Um, it, it it appears to be that sort of a thing, but yeah, I don't I don't I don't quite know because I can't get in. I know, I know, and the thing is, it, it's hard to really judge it if it's rad or fad. The only thing that I will say is that I, I'm intrigued, <laughs> and sometimes when I can't get into a service right away, I feel like uh, I don't. Know, it doesn't sound that interesting, but because I think the concept is something that we haven't really seen before. You know, it's not like she's coming out with something, and she does this time and time again. You know, always has. She's always innovating, coming up with something really new and interesting. Um, so I'm hopeful for this one. Um, I think it sounds kind of rad, uh, and uh, I can't can't wait to sign up. So we'll have to keep a watch on this one like we have with other services out there. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that this will be rad just because uh, the team behind the service is good and solid and smart. Hmm. Uh, but I guess technically it's it's a it's a tentative red um in, in my vote uh, it's all a it's lowercase red all lowercase <laughs> yeah it's a red with an asterisk well no that's different yeah uh, yeah <laughs> it's yeah exactly potential um, red potential maybe she'd red. want to come on the show and talk to us about it she's been on the Love show it. before i think yeah uh yeah. not yeah. with me so it might have been back in the net at night days with leo <laughs> Yeah, I think she came on to talk about Hunch. I could be wrong, but I, there's, I have some memory of that. Well, gosh, I mean, I, I maybe I just have a bad memory. Um, I used to love Hunch. Um, I haven't been there in a while. So it uh, sounds like uh, she is focusing her efforts on new ventures. So that's pinwheel.com. If you want to at least put in your email address um, 
to be invited at a later time, just go to pinwheel.com and they've got that. Great name. Yeah, I love it. Fun name, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it it looks great. Looks great. You got a map, you got people. I I like it so far. Tentative rad. All right, Amber, we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, That is it for this edition of the Social Hour. Remember, uh, regular schedule. Um, We will not be live next Monday. Uh, If you're already watching the show, then this is your Monday show. Um, But uh, next Monday, we will be dark. But the following Monday, we'll be back to our regular scheduled time. Monday's at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Our website. That's the 27th, I think, right? February 27th? Correct. Yes, February 27th. Everything goes back to normal. Um, Our website is twit.tv slash TSH if you want to keep up with us in the meantime. And, of course, you can find our show on iTunes or or a variety of places uh, that people uh, find podcasts from. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.